Hello guys and welcome back again to another episode of the Babylonian Crypto Channel. Today we're going to talk about a framework for crypto fundamental analysis. And the ideas here are actually inspired and originated from Folius Ventures. And I just read their report a few weeks back and I'll put them down in the link below. So I had a call with Jason who is the co-founding partner of Folius Ventures. And they are a VC investment firm backed by Parafy Capital and Dragonfly Capital. And he's a very smart and talented guy whom I've learned a lot. So I'll be sharing all of these uh, key research insights that I've gathered both from reading the report as well as the conversations we had. And by the way, for those who are curious, folios actually means like a uh, one leaf. And so in Chinese, there is a quote, right, called 一叶之秋 and 一叶帐目. So 一叶帐目 means when something as small as a leaf falls in front of your eyes, it blocks off your vision of the world. And you can't see afar, you can't see the big things that are happening around you. You are short-sighted and oblivious and ignorant of what is going on around you. On the other hand, 一叶之秋 means that something as simple as a leaf, when it drops on the ground, you can immediately tell that the autumn season is coming soon. So this means to say that a person can observe the future developments and trends of the macro world just by something as small and subtle as the leaf. So that's just some fun facts. Now let's get into this uh, framework for crypto fundamental analysis. So typically when one wants to look at whether a project is undervalued or overvalued, what do they look at? It is the typical FDV over TVL or the market cap over TVL, right? This is the equivalent of our price to book ratio in trade file. But how about ROE, return on equity? Can we calculate ROE in crypto uh, using this DuPont analysis in trade file, which takes your net profit margin? times your return on assets times the financial leverage. So why if we take all these trade file equivalent concepts and formulas and translate them into crypto, how would it look like? So if you translate directly, this TVL over circulating market cap will be your assets divided by equity. And then this total revenue over TVL will be your sales divided by assets, which is your ROA. And this is your net profit margin, total protocol revenue over total revenue. And then you get the net return on equity for token holders. So if you look at what individually all this means, this is actually just asking how much liquidity assets are you attracting relative to your protocol size. And this is asking how much revenue are you generating for every dollar of TVL that you have in your protocol or application. And then finally, this is your net profit margin, which is just uh, how much returns are you generating for the hodlers, for the governance, for the stickers. And ROE actually just measures the net earning yields for every dollar of equity. And the reason why we want to dissect and break down all this formula equation is to actually gain a deeper insight into each of these uh, areas individually and to see what went right, what went wrong. And then you can also make relative comparison at a more granular level. So if you look at this TVL over circulating market cap, what is this actually trying to tell? It is actually trying to say, whether there is product demand and interest. So if you can't even attract people to deposit capital with your protocol, then it essentially means that you have failed already. And that's the first step of any successful project. And that is to increase TVL. If you can't do this, that means it's gone already. And then the second one, this is actually telling you whether there is a product market fit and adoption. Because revenue means you are charging something for a service, right? And this tells you whether there is demand from users in using your application or protocol and is also a measure of the capital efficiency on how much value are you extracting from the pool of TVL sitting inside your protocol. So this is like your product market fit. And the third one is actually value accrual for token holders. So how much of this revenue generation actually goes back to the governance stakers and the token holders. Because typically your total revenue is divided between the supply side, right? And this is like your miners, validators, liquidity providers, lenders, and etc. But how much of it actually goes back to the token holders itself? So that is the whole idea of this metric here. And so ROE is actually just a measurement of the protocol's ability to generate income for the hodlers. And then for the total revenue of DEX, you can actually further break them down into trading revenue over TVL times 
the total revenue over trading volume. So this actually just measure the capital efficiency of your DEX. And this is particularly important in DEX because when there's very little trading volume against a lot of uh, TVL capital deposit by, by the liquidity providers, then that means there's a very, very low capital efficiency and this will incur high slippage, high transaction fees and all this. So combining all these equations together, you are able to calculate and break down the individual components that contribute to the protocol earnings that you are receiving as a token holder for every dollar of equity stake in the network. So using Sushi as one example, we can actually calculate their ROE by plugging in all these figures. It is uh, 4.9 billion or 1.34 billion times your return on assets times your net profit margin. So it's 3.65 times 8.4% ROA times 16.7% net profit margin. And then you get 4.67%. That means for every dollar you invest in the Sushi protocol, you are actually getting 4.67 in fees. Now, is that good or bad? Well, traditionally in trade five, 10 to 15% is normal. And then anything above 25 to 30% is good. But this is crypto. And it will also be better if you use a average over a trend for a more accurate results. But overall, this gives you an idea of evaluating crypto projects from another angle. And that is from a hodler's perspective instead of the traditional price to sales or price to earnings ratios. But before that, why is everyone so fixated on TVL and revenue? And do such fundamentals actually matter in crypto? The answer is yes, it does matter to a certain extent. So this guy, Thomas, he actually wrote an article detailing which category in crypto generate the most revenue. And most of them actually comes from these uh, L1 protocols. Then he compared the revenue share by categories against the total circulating market cap of these categories. So you can see that uh, L1 generates about 78%, but they actually take out 88% of the market cap share. So if it's a one-to-one, -one, it means direct correlation, right? That means for every dollar of revenue, it is equivalent to every dollar increase in market cap. But you can see that L1, they are actually paying a 10% premium, possibly because of the Fed protocol disease. But exchange, interestingly, is trading at a very huge discount to the revenue, partly because maybe they are low margin business and they are favoring more towards the supply side of uh, liquidity providers over the token holders. And then over on this uh, right hand side, this chart, he actually compared the market cap and the dependent factors and found out that TVL actually has a very high correlation to market cap, followed by volume and followers. And that's the reason why right, these protocols are also focused on driving these KPI figures up because this is what people look at in crypto and price actually follows this metric. So if that's the social consensus in crypto right now, how does a crypto drive these numbers up? And the answer is, token incentives. And this problem can be better summarized by Andre, which he has uh, talked about it in his most recent articles a few days back. So he mentioned that token emission is considered a bootstrapping mechanism. And when a protocol starts, it usually has zero fees. In blockchains, you need security. But now assume that there are no block rewards and only fees are distributed to validators. Would you run a node if you receive zero rewards? So instead, these chains are bootstrapped with block rewards, but the goal is for these block rewards to eventually stop and fees should be enough for incentives for participants. Protocols are no different, so they use tokens to bootstrap whatever their incentivized goal is, whether is it TVL, liquidity, or fees, or lending, borrowing, and so forth. So if you plot out the lifespan of a project in crypto, it typically looks like this. So this x-axis is the time, and y-axis is how much revenue the protocol is generating. So it starts off with uh, token emissions to bootstrap this whole uh, system and then you want to achieve some kind of TVL or KPI metric and it eventually reach a certain point where the protocol is self-generating revenue. And the biggest risk here is actually buying into a project that is not sustainable. So meaning to say that they print a lot of tokens in the early phase but they fail to generate revenue and you end up with a diluted supply of useless tokens at the end of the day, and all these incentives are gone, the capital is also gone. So this means that this project has found zero product market fit, and people are actually there just for incentives. Then the next question is, how much does it cost to acquire X? 
X being it could be the cost of security in a blockchain, it could be the cost of attracting 1 billion TVL, it could be the cost of attracting assets, liquidity or whatever. And this expense comes in the form of token emissions, token incentives. So how much tokens do you need to incentivize you achieving Go X? We can actually break this question down into a formula traditionally known as LTV over CAC where LTV is actually the lifetime value and CAC is actually the customer acquisition cost. So the idea is to compare the value of a customer over their lifetime to the cost of acquiring them. And the formula for LTV is just your net profit per customer divided by the churn rate. So churn rate is meant by how many customers are leaving. So for example, if your churn rate is like 5% every month, then it means that uh, for every 100 subscribers, 5% unsubscribe to you. So if you invert this formula by taking 1 divided by churn rate, then you get the average lifetime of a customer, which is 20 months for example. But as you know, in crypto, you can immediately see the problem here already. There's zero concept of loyalty. And the concept of churn rate is extremely high and dependent not just on incentives, but also on the price of Bitcoin, uh, volatility. Let's say if there's a sudden market crash, suddenly everyone just pull out their liquidity. So LTV is really hard to justify in crypto, but we could still use the same logic and thought process to create a formula that captures the same meaning. And that is the KPI growth rate divided by the token emission. So KPI could be anything that your project is interested in. And then the token emission, it is important to actually differentiate the category of token emissions because some of them could be just unlocked from seed investors or team, which is not intended to be used as an incentive for driving KPI metrics. And the idea here is that for every percent of inflationary incentives, how much X KPI is growing? How much value are you capturing? If this ratio is very high, that means it is a sign of a very strong project and is generating KPI value with little need for incentives to power growth. But if it's below one, that means it's not really a healthy sign because a lot of these tokens have to be printed for the protocol to be doing something. And the best kind of project is actually those that are deflationary so that means that the token is burning or the supply is actually reducing. So your denominator here is actually negative. But yet, your KPI is actually still going up. So traditionally, in trade 5 world, above 3 is considered very, very good. But I think right now in crypto, I haven't seen anything above 3 yet. So putting this into a sample use case, here is one example of how you can use this metric, right? So the first line here, you can track your KPI growth. So we use TVL for example in this case, and here you track your circulating token supply, which is your emission rate. Now again, note that it is used for incentives, not unlocked for stickers or team vesting schedule. Then you can calculate the percentage growth in the token supply and how much value KPI are you generating, which is uh, this line E over here, KPI growth divided by token inflation. So the higher the better because that means less token emission is needed to generate more KPI. So assuming every dollar of TVL is equivalent to $1 increase in market cap, then the idea here is that price should increase as long as your LTV over CAC is greater than 1. So you can see that if it's less than 1, for example in month 2, month 3 and month 4, your price actually drops. But then on month 5, when it increased by 2.94, the price actually pumped by almost 18%. So if you want to do some kind of price calculation target in the future, you can actually extrapolate uh, the forward KPI projections, the growth rate, and then also the forward uh, inflation rate uh, to a certain end period of a month. And then you can calculate, let's say by the end of the year, what is the estimated price target of this uh, token. And again, all these assumptions and parameters definitely can be tweaked and refined to get a more better uh, accurate result. And for those who are really keen in building this uh, model up, you can also backtest them and compare to like other protocols. So personally, I tested this concept of LTV over CAC for Abracadabra spell. So I've digged through all the data and compiled together a visual in Power BI for the past 3-4 months. And this light blue one is actually their cumulative emission. And then the revenue is actually the dark blue one and the red line is the net emission which is just the emission minus the revenue. So 
there are plans actually to go to zero emission and eventually deflationary and that's why you can see that the red line is actually starting to see the curve uh, flattening. So with these two metric, you can actually calculate the LTV over CAC, which is this red line over here. But actually, their token emissions are not used to incentivize revenue. It is actually used for TVL for liquidity purposes. But for this case study, I'll just use uh, revenue, for example. So you can see that in the early days, their emission is very, very high and their revenue is very, very low. And that's why you can see that this ratio is actually decreasing. And interestingly, it acts as a forward indicator because what happens when it reaches the lowest point around this time period, the price actually starts dumping. And then when it starts to increase again, the price starts moving up again. So it acts like a forward indicator and there's quite a relatively strong correlation to it. And if they continue to generate more revenue while reducing emissions, I'm not sure how the dynamics of liquidity would affect the revenue in the, in the long run, but this red line would keep going up and we could potentially see a price divergence between the spell token and their fundamentals. So if this divergence gets bigger and bigger, then it could be a good buy for spell. So that's just one example of how, again, you can use uh, LTV CAC and do some comparisons against the price chart. So in summary, here are some considerations and pointers to keep in mind. First is that the growth in TVL it is important to understand if it is attributed to the increase in deposits or the market price increase. So if you use like TVL market cap or market cap over TVL, then it is still okay because the price is factored in on uh, both sides of the equation. But if you are using metrics, for example, like the KPI divided by the token inflation, then you have to be careful because then you might end up overestimating your ratio, thinking that you are generating very high KPI growth but in fact, it's just the price of the crypto market as a whole going up. And second is that the framework is more applicable for internal projects. In reality, all these KPI growth met metrics are actually uh, quite hard to find. It's not easy. It's not publicly available and accessible. And it's more suitable for internal project founders to do all this kind of analysis. And number three is that crypto is volatile, erratic, and unpredictable. Most of the price today is driven by short-term hype and narrative. So the resilience of these model calculations and assumptions can be easily broken, especially in very volatile conditions. And number four is that this is just a conceptual framework. It is a guiding principle for crypto investment analysis, but it certainly does give one a clearer visibility and insights into the mechanics of each project tokenomics and price behavior to a certain extent. And that's it for this video. I hope you found this insightful and valuable. If you want to read the full report uh, done by Folius Ventures, I will again put the link down below and do give them a follow. And if you have any questions or thoughts, do also comment down below for discussions. And if you want to show your thanks for the time and effort in putting all this research together, I will appreciate if you can subscribe, share, Hit the bell button and I'll see you again in the next video. Bye!